from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So we're very excited um, to, to be here also. The Post has been a very big supporter of the National Book Festival for 10 years. Um, we're a charter sponsor of the festival, and we're thrilled that we've had such an amazing turnout today. And, and this pavilion is just full of such excited faces. It's really great. Um, I was actually told to do a one-minute um, introduction of Catherine Patterson, and I have to say, I could stand here for more than a minute and just list all the awards that she has won. That would certainly make it easy, but it would be a really boring little introduction, so um, I'm going to try and say a couple of things. She clearly, though, is a towering figure in, in children's literature. Um, she is a two-time winner of the Newbery Medal and the National Book Award for her, um, for her titles, Bridge to Terabithia, Jacob I Have Loved, The Great Gilly Hopkins, and The Master Puppeteer. Her books are almost not children's literature because they really do deal with many themes that you don't often find in books for children. At the same time, though, her characters triumph in such wonderful ways, even if they are children themselves. So her treatment of her characters is really very much like the treatment of her readers. She, she treats them with the utmost respect and admiration, and that is why she is so loved. Um, it's no wonder the Library of Congress has named her, um, named her in 2000 a living legend. I, wouldn't we all like to be named a living legend at some point in our life? Um, and she is currently the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Please welcome Katherine Patterson. I cannot believe all of you have waited this long on this hot day, um, but it's wonderful to see you, and it's, has anybody been a great day? I, I've just, <coughs> uh, I hope you've had half as good a time as I've had uh, today. I love this festival, and uh, don't tell anybody, I've been to four of them, because they try not to invite people too often. Uh, <laughs> And I don't, I don't want them to know how often they've invited me. I hope their list has been lost or something so that I can come again uh, very soon. Uh, uh, I was told that this afternoon you'd like to hear about my newest book. Uh, and someone said to me, but it's different from all your other books. And I said, yeah, most of my books are all different from every other book. Uh, but this is uh, different because I'm writing about uh, a country that I've never been to and about uh, people who speak a language I've never spoken, and I've never done that before. I, I wrote this book called The Day of the Pelican uh, because one Sunday after church, Steve Dale, who's also in the choir, said to me, I think you should write about the high Jews. Now, over the many years that I've been a writer, I cannot tell you how many times someone has come up to me and said, I've got a great idea for you to, uh, for a book. All you have to do is write it. <laughs> <coughs> to which I have said, and I hope politely, I think that's your idea. I think you should write it. <laughs> but uh, I was looking for an idea at that time for a newspaper serial. Some years ago, Avi, the young adult writer, got a bunch of us involved in what we call breakfast serials. And you write a chapter uh, a every week for the newspapers who subscribe. And uh, of course, you have to end every page, every chapter with a cliffhanger, so they'll buy the paper the next week. But because newspaper space is limited, each chapter is only three double space pages long. So three double space pages ending in a cliffhanger and about 15 chapters of that. And I thought about it, uh, and I thought, well, so much was happening in Kosovo back in the late uh, 90s. I think I could make three pages of the cliffhanger out, out of that if I did plenty of research. So I did three pages on a cliffhanger and 15 chapters of it, and I felt pretty good about it. it it went around to about 100 newspapers, and people seemed to respond positively. But my editor, who had Virginia Buckley, who's been my, my editor since 1970, said to me, I think you should turn that story 
into a novel. I said, Virginia, I can't do that. I could do three pages in a cliffhanger, and for that I had to do two years of research. <laughs> I, I don't know how the people talk. I don't know what they wear. I don't know what they eat. Uh, and she said, well, I think you really should try because it's a story that people need to hear. So I, I did more research, but <laughs> just really to prove to Virginia that it was impossible, I went to the Internet and began looking for pictures of Kosovo. And I found almost 200 absolutely gorgeous pictures taken by a man who called himself Kosovo Cajun, which sounded like a very interesting name. So I emailed Kosovo Cajun, who turned out to be a man named Mark Ophila, uh, uh, naturally from Louisiana. But Mark had lived for seven years in Kosovo. He knew the language. He knew the people very well. He and his wife had, been, had worked in a Macedonian refugee camp during the worst of the tragedy. And he loved Kosovo. And so I, I told him what my problem was. I said, I, I'm desperate to find someone who will help me because all of my attempts, the Hydru family had long ago moved away from Barry. And all of my attempts to get in touch with other refugees from Kosovo had failed. I, only, I live in Vermont, which is sor sort of limits you, uh, although we do have a lot of refugees in Vermont. So I asked him a couple of questions, which he immediately answered. And that gave me a hope to ask him to read my, my drafts and, and help me uh, not make any horrible mistakes as I wrote the story. So the second email he wrote me, he said, you know, when I answered your first email, I'd never heard of you before. <laughs> but I mentioned you to your, my wife and my mother. His mother had been a school librarian. <laughs> They seemed to know who you were. <laughs> so Mark uh, was the most wonderful help, and you'll notice that the book is dedicated to him because I couldn't have done it without him. Uh, I would send him, I would write a chapter, and I would email it to him, and my, of course my chapter would be in black, and he would reply paragraph by paragraph in red, and the black paragraph was this long, and the red paragraph was this long. And we just kept working until there was no more red on the page. Uh, so I owe everything to Mark. Um, he, he was wonderful. Sometimes he would give me answers I didn't want to hear because I thought something else would be more dramatic. But uh, we were determined to keep the book as authentic and as true to the, to the actual events as we possibly could. Uh, I'm going to read. I know there's somebody who's going to flash cards at me and tell me when to shut up, and I do want to leave time for questions, but I'd like to read a little bit from the book if that's all right. And it's not quite fair because I'm going to read way over towards the end of the book, but I want to do that because I think perhaps this is the thing that's most important for us to think about in uh, this day and time when we are having all kinds of problems not only with refugees and immigration, but our whole attitude towards people of Muslim faith is being sorely tested. So <coughs> the, the Leshi family has gone through all kinds of terrible events in their native Kosovo. Uh, they've been in a Macedonian refugee camp, and then a church in Vermont has sponsored them to come to this country. They're settling in, they've been here about two years, and then the sky falls. <coughs> At home, they watched on television as the plane hit the second tower over and over again. And as both towers crumbled to giant piles of debris over and over again, their throats were dry they could not speak or look at each other. Turn it off, Baba commanded. He had been sent home from work early. No one had come to the restaurant. Everyone in America was at home watching the planes crash and the towers fall. Did they eat that night? They must have. But afterward, Melly couldn't remember eating. 
just the replay of the planes crashing and the towers falling. Even with the screen black, the image of the disaster played on in her mind. After Blora and the younger boys were put to bed, Mehmet turned the TV on again. That was when they heard the news that the whole world now knew. The terrorists who had crashed the planes into the Twin Towers and blown open the Pentagon were all Muslims. Baba shook his head in disbelief. This is not the way of the prophet, he said. This is sickness, madness. The next day, going to her locker, Melly realized that people were staring at her and that after she passed knots of students in the halls, there was silence and then a whispered exchange. She was used to people not speaking to her, but this was different. Everyone is upset. We're all afraid. A number of people had stayed home fearing somehow that the terrorists would find their way to Vermont and bomb the largest building in their town, which was the high school. And over a little way, they go to their sports. They're both wonderful soccer players. The principal announced over the PA system that classes and activities would go on as usual, but nothing felt usual. During soccer practice, no one passed her the ball. She tried to pretend that she didn't notice the strange look sent her way. Once she found herself sprawling on the field, no one had meant to trip her, had they? But later, as she showered, she could hear one of the seniors talking. It was Brittany, the varsity goalkeeper. She seemed to be talking loudly on purpose so that Melly couldn't help but hear her over the noise of the water. That's what her family is, Brittany was saying. She's one of them, her and that weird brother of hers. No, someone protested. She's okay. Just ask her, Brittany said. You'll see. Should she just stay in the shower, pretend she'd heard nothing? But that seemed cowardly. Millie turned off the water, wrapped her towel around herself, and stepped out into the locker room. It was as if someone had pushed the mute button. No noise, just stares. Brittany, the only fully dressed girl in the room, gave Rachel a shove. Go ahead, ask her. Rachel, who'd been trying to put on her jeans, nearly fell on her face. She caught her balance and then glanced back at Brittany before turning red-faced toward Melly. Someone said you were one of them, Melly, she said, her voice hardly more than a whisper. That's not true, is it? What do you mean, them, Melly asked. I don't understand. She looked from one team member to another. If you mean what nationality, I am Kosovar. But what's that, Brittany asked. It's not Christian, is it? No. Her throat was so tight that she could hardly speak. No, Serbs are Christian. I am not a Serb. I, my family is Albanian. I thought you just said Kosovar. Brittany's eyes narrowed to a slit. Yeah, Melly, it was Crystal, the junior whose place Melly had taken on the varsity squad. What are you really? I told you, I am Albanian Kosovar. Come on, Melly. Brittany stepped around Rachel and glared at Melly. You are one of them, you know you are. Explain what you mean, them. Of course by now, Melly knew full well what Brittany and the others meant by them, but she wanted to make Brittany say it out loud to her face. How am I one of them? She leaned so close to Brittany that she could see the pimples on the girl's cheeks set to explode. Brittany straightened. Like the terrorist, she stepped back slightly. You know, like their religion. I'm not a religious person. Melly walked over toward her locker and opened it. I told you she wasn't Christian. I'm not a religious person, Melly continued, keeping her eyes on her locker and her voice as steady as she could. 
But if I have to choose Christian or Muslim, then okay, I am Muslim. She turned around. But that doesn't make me one of them. I'm not a terrorist. Brittany shoved Rachel forward once more. Millie wrapped her towel more tightly around herself and looked into the face of the girl she had thought of as her friend. Rachel looked everywhere except at Millie. Ask her about her brother, Rachel, Brittany demanded. Ask if he's a terrorist. It is not terrorist to want to fight for your homeland. As soon as the words were out of her mouth, Millie knew she should never have said them. Rachel backed away, her eyes wide. See, Brittany yelled so loud her voice reverberated round the tile. See, I told you. She whirled around toward the locker. Opening the door, she grabbed her book bag and threw it over her shoulder before she turned again toward Millie. Why don't you and your brother just go back to where you came from? We don't want any Muslim terrorists around here. With that, she slammed her locker shut and marched out of the locker room. For a few minutes, they all stared at the door as it swung behind Brittany. And then, careful not to look at Mellie's way, everyone finished dressing quickly and left, leaving Mellie standing there alone, shivering in her towel. Pull yourself together, get dressed, go home, she was thinking in Albanian. How long had it been since she'd done that? She thought in Albanian only when speaking to Mama and Baba, never in school. She smiled grimly then, carefully, methodically, dried herself and put on her street clothes. Next, she gathered up her practice uniform, her freshly laundered game uniform, her shin guards and her mouth guard, and took them all through the swinging door to the coach's office. She carefully folded her practice uniform into a square and laid everything down on the desk in a neat stack. With a sheet of paper torn from her notebook, she scribbled a short note for Mrs. Rogers and laid it on top of the pile. Then she walked out of the school door into the crisp autumn air. Mehmet was waiting for her as he used to back in Kosovo. She could see that someone had bloodied his nose. He had tried to wash it away, but there were still traces of blood around the nostrils. She did not have the strength to ask him why. They walked home in silence. Mama and Baba were both home. There was no work for them that day. What happened? Mama asked, looking back and forth from Millie's face to Mehmet's. I'm going home, Mehmet said. Baba turned off the TV and got up. What is going on? I'm going home, Mehmet said again. I hate America. Baba put his arm around Mehmet's shoulder. You must tell me what happened, Mehmet. Mehmet looked at the floor. They were all swearing against the terrorists. Then they said all Muslims are terrorists and Americans must kill them before they destroy America. And then Mellie could see how close to tears he was in his anger. And then I said, I am Muslim. Will you kill me? So he blew out his breath. So they tried. He wiped his nose on the back of his hand, making it bleed again. I'm never going back to that school. They think I'm like those terrorists. They hate me. He looked up defiantly into Baba's face. Well. I hate them. We are even. And then I'm going to read a little later scene that takes place that night. She dimly heard the telephone ring in the kitchen and didn't think to wonder who might be calling. But before long, Baba knocked on her half-open door. Mellie, are you dressed? Yes, Baba. She whispered so as not to wake Laura, who was sleeping peacefully in the other bed. Wash your face and comb your hair. We have visitors coming. Visitors? At nine o'clock at night? Then she heard Baba at Mehmet's door. She didn't want to listen to them argue. She couldn't bear it. She went quickly to the bathroom and washed her face. She patted down her hair and then went into the kitchen where Mama was busy making coffee. She had changed into her nicest dress. Mama? 
Take some chairs from the kitchen into the parlor, Millie. We need more chairs in there. As she was bringing in a second chair, Baba and Mehmet emerged from the boys' room. Help your sister, Mehmet, Baba said. Mehmet brought her in a chair and sat down on it, his body as stiff as a pole. Melly and Mama sat on the others. She waited for some explanation from Baba, but none came. At length, they could hear footsteps on the stairs. It sounded like a number of people. Police, they're going to arrest us for being Muslims. No, that was crazy. P police didn't call ahead to say they were coming. And Mama wouldn't be dressed up and making coffee if she thought they were all going to be hauled off to jail. It was a ridiculous fear. Still, it was a few seconds before her heart stopped racing. Just some of the welcomers, surely, but why would they come so late at night? At the knock, Baba nodded at Melly, so she got up and opened the door. The first person she saw in the dark hallway was Mrs. Rogers. Just behind her was Mr. Marcello, and with them, Adana. Why was Adana here? They hadn't needed a translator for months. Mehmet or she or one of the other children had done all the translating for their parents. The three visitors were in the process of taking off their shoes. Adana must have told the others, too. Americans didn't seem to know how important that was. Let the guests in, Melly, Baba said. He and Mama stood up. When Mehmet saw his coach, he started for his bedroom, but Mama grabbed his arm. How are you, Melly? Mrs. Rogers asked. Melly tried to smile back, but her face felt frozen. Adana stepped forward and said to Baba in Ab Albanian, these are the children's coaches for playing soccer. She introduced Mrs. Rogers and Mr. Marcella to Mama and Baba. The adults shook hands formally. Then Baba indicated that everyone, including Mehmet, was to take a seat. The three guests sat down on the couch. I have made coffee, Mama said shyly to Adana. Shall I bring it out? We don't have any cola or mineral water, but Adana shook her head. I don't think so, she said. It's late. They won't stay long. Mr. Marcella was sitting on the edge of the couch cushion. He had taken off his baseball cap and was playing with it. The light from the ceiling fixture seemed to bounce off his bald scalp. Finally, without looking at Baba, he spoke to Adana. Tell Mr. Leshy, the coach said, that I've come to apologize for what happened to his son today. Adana translated. Mehmet sat like a stone on the kitchen chair, his lips tight, a bruise on his face dark against his red cheek. Melly could still see the dried blood in his nostrils. Tell him. The coach continued, that it will never happen again. I will not tolerate this kind of behavior. Tomorrow those boys are off the team for good. As Adana translated, Millie saw that Mr. Marcella had a hole in one of his socks. She could see his big toe sticking out like a tiny bald head. Poor man, she thought, how hard this must be for him. She glanced at Mehmet to see if he felt any pity for his coach. If he did, there was no sign of it. And you should tell Mr. and Mrs. Leshy that I totally agree with Coach Marcella, Mrs. Rogers said. I'm cutting every girl who took part in that scene in the locker room today. But that would be the whole team, Melly thought, and then wondered how her coach had found out what had happened. Someone must have been ashamed and told her. Melly hoped it had been Rachel. I should have been there. I'm usually just next door in my office, but I'd been called to the main office, so I wasn't there when it happened. Otherwise, I cannot tell you how, how sorry I am. Baba listened, his head bent toward the translator to make sure he understood every word. When Adana finished, he looked up at the coaches. Thank you, he said. Then he turned back to Adana. Tell the kind teachers that it would not be a good thing to remove those boys and girls for all the more. Tell the teachers that my children are strong. They have endured many hard things in their short lives. They can also endure this. He waited for Adana to say the words in English. When she paused, he continued. Tell them my children wish to be respected as fellow teammate, teammates and not despised because of their heritage. This is the way of the old country. This is America, tell them. 
In America, everyone has a new beginning. When Adana finished translating Mrs. Rogers' smile, first at Baba, Baba and then at Millie, and what about you, Millie, she asked softly. Do you agree? Should I let everyone stay on the team? Yes, like Baba said, even Brittany. You can't have a team without a goalkeeper. Coach Marcella turned and spoke directly to Mehmet. What about you at Mehmet? How do you feel about this? Mehmet didn't answer. He sat very still, his eyes on the floor. Tell the teacher, Baba said, speaking to Adana, but looking all the while at Mehmet. Tell the teacher that my son has endured much more painful hardship than this. As a child, he was once in a Serbian jail where he was beaten and left in a field to die. As Adana translated, Millie saw Mr. Marcella's eyes widen. Mrs. Rogers gasped. He is very brave, my son, Baba continued, and I'm very proud of him. He will do the right thing, you will see. Now Mehmet looked up at Baba and for a moment, Millie imagined she saw tears in her brother's eyes. He did not wait for Adana to finish her translation before he said quietly, Baba is right. One man does not make a team. We must play together or there's no game. Coach Marcella's hand stopped fiddling with his cap. He cleared his throat. Thank you, Mehmet, he said. Then very quietly so that Millie did not hear it until it was repeated in her own language. He says to tell you, Mr. Leshy, that you are a good man and he hopes that he will be as good a father to his children as you are to yours. Tell the kind teachers, Baba answered, that Mehmet and Meli will be back for practice tomorrow. Thank you. I've been signaled that we have four minutes, so I, if I don't make the answers too long, we should have a time for a few questions. And I think there are mics in the um, aisle if, if anybody wants to step up and ask a question. Hi. Hi. I was wondering how you maintain authenticity when you're speaking from the voice of a child or a young person and how you maintain that connection. Oh, how do I maintain the connection with the child that I'm writing about? Yeah, you mentioned a little bit how you've had authenticity talking about Kosovo and that experience. And speaking from the perspective of a young person, I'm curious how you're so authentic. I really enjoyed reading your books as a young person, and it, it really spoke to me. And so I'm Thank curious you. how you did that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it, it's always very mysterious to me um, because, see my gray hair? <laughs> um, I, um, I don't think I have actually a very good memory for details of my childhood and young youth. But I think I have a good emotional memory, and that's what I rely on when I write. Um, I remember how things felt. And um, in this book, I remember how it felt to be a refugee. I remember how it felt to come to the United States and be despised by my classmates. Uh, so I think that helped me uh, in writing the book. Yes? Um, what is your inspiration for the book Bridge to Terabithia? I wrote Bridge to Terabithia because our son David's best friend was a girl and the summer they were both eight years old and she was struck and killed by lightning and it was such a terrible tragedy I began to write the book to try to make sense of a tragedy that didn't make any sense to me. Uh, I didn't for one minute think it was going to comfort my grieving son but I did think it might help me and it, indeed, it's always been a very hard book for David to read. I think until he was in his 40s and uh, actually made the movie, uh, I think that was the thing that helped him the most, to go back and revisit the book and to put it in another form. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, by the way, I like the book. Thank you. <laughs> mm, yes. 
Well, it depends on the book. I did write a book in the shower once, <laughs> but that's a record. And I've taken a lot of showers since then, and I've no more books in the shower. Um, but uh, that was really terrific. It was a fairy story called The King's Equal, and it just came to me all in a rush. Usually it takes me, uh, I used to say it took me a year. Now I say year, two years, three years, um, depending on, on uh, how much research and also what else is happening in my life. How are we doing on time down there, Adele? One more minute. I guess we have time for one more question. Um, I love your books, and what was your reaction to um, um, the people that bought all your books so quickly? Oh, can you think of anything that would make you happier than to have people lined up with books that they had paid for, for you to sign that you had written? Uh, you know, when I'm in that situation, I just wish all those publishers who wouldn't publish my books could be there that day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I consider that the perfect revenge, don't you? <laughs> I think I have to quit now, I'm sorry, because another program is coming in, but thank you so much for your patience and being with me. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.